Marco, that's great. So our next stage in our conference um, event this, this afternoon uh, involves a panel discussion on the text of Ms. Cota's book, uh, The Biblical ABCs. Um, I'll introduce the panelists very briefly uh, to you before we begin. We have three panelists uh, for our discussion this afternoon. The first is Susanna Ticciotti, who comes to us from King's College London. Um, Susanna uh, is a uh, recently promoted professor of Christian theology there, uh, and uh, among her many publications is a new forthcoming book called Reading Augustine, Signs, Christ, Truth, and the Interpretation of Scripture, which I hope I've got right. Uh, welcome, Susanna. Uh, joining her is Kate Sondreger, uh, who is in Amsterdam, though uh, uh, hails from Virginia Theological Seminary, where she's professor of systematic theology there. Um, she, of course, will be known to many of you as the author of the first two of uh, 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 the first two volumes of a ongoing systematic theology project. The third volume of which um, the title I, I see exists in the ether: Divine Missions, Christology, and Pneumatology. Uh, joining uh, Kate uh, and Susanna is uh, is Christoph Chalamet as well. Christoph is uh, ordinary professor of theology at the University of Geneva, though though calling in from uh, um, somewhere else, nice and continental, I think today. Um, Christoph, uh, as, as our other guest, is the author of many books, which uh, you will know. His most recent book, uh, in English in any case, is, is entitled A Most Excellent Way, an essay on faith, hope, and love, uh, to which one of the reviewers said, Christoph Chalamet is the most important theologian full stop, which I thought was a pretty good review. Um, so Christoph, Kate, and Susanna, welcome. Um, the format is not mysterious. Um, each of our panelists has been asked to prepare some remarks about 20 minutes or so in length. Um, they will have done that, I trust. Um, we're going to hear them in turn. Um, they've uh, read the book. In some cases, uh, uh, it will have been a first encounter with Ms. Kota. In some cases, a, a kind of renewal of an acquaintance. But in all cases, it's, it'll be the first time that um, that they, like, like many of us who are uh, on the call today, uh, have encountered this particular book. And so we're uh, looking forward to hearing uh, th their comments and impressions. We'll hear them uh, hear from, from them in turn. I think we'll go in the order in which this, the script has us listed. So Susanna first, then Kate, and then Christoph. Um, we'll save our questions, I think, until the end, as has become the practice. If you have questions you, you want to put into the conversation, please do drop them into the chat, and I'll be sure to pick them up when we open up the, the discussion more, more widely after we've heard from all three. Um, we'll also, of course, give them a chance to, to speak to each other uh, after they've each uh, spoken individually. I'm sure that there'll be th themes and questions which coalesce, and hopefully will take us into the heart of the matter. So. Without any f f further ado, let me invite Susanna. Sorry, I'm pointing over here because that's where you are on my screen uh, to, to uh, take us into the conversation with your first paper. Thank you. Many thanks indeed, Phil, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me. I am indeed a relative newcomer to Miss Gotter, so it's a particular pleasure um, to be here with you all today to find out some more. Um, as promised, I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about paganism, Miss Gotter's critique of paganism. If I don't sound the, ode, um, the note of honouring quite as much as I should, um, please correct me, but I heard more of the critique. Um, and as I understood it, paganism is the umbrella term for what he singles out for critique. Uh, to learn the language of the Bible is to learn how to resist paganism in submission to the God who sets Israel apart from the nations, thereby calling it out of its natural paganism um, and releasing it in turn to call upon God's name, that name which distinguishes God uh, from the many pagan gods. In the short time available, my aim is to identify the dynamics of the paganism so critiqued uh, in a way that at least impl implicitly brings out the purchase they have not only in Miss Gotter's own time, but also in our own. The gods may take many forms, but they operate according to certain fundamental presuppositions, or so I hypothesize, I think, with Miss Gotter. To learn the language of the Bible is to learn alternative presuppositions, 
One might articulate these alternative sets of presuppositions, pagan and biblical, in a variety of ways. And I think we've already had one way of doing that in Miriam's wonderful paper. Uh, following Ms. Scotter's implicit lead, I take my entry point as the question of how uh, divine and creaturely agency are configured in relation to one another. Uh, I will argue that a pagan logic in Ms. Scotter's rendition collapses divine into creaturely agency, and in doing so, elides the space for creaturely self-critique. While a biblical logic, on the other hand, sets divine and cre creaturely agency in asymmetrical but non-competitive relation, precisely holding open the space for creaturely self-reflexivity and self-critique. Um, and that's also a theme I think we've heard already a little bit today. I'll, I'll first identify the pagan sin as at root self-deception, and that's something I'll unpack um, uh, as we go along. Catherine Tanner's now classic God and creation in Christian theology, tyranny or empowerment, is the go-to for a non-competitive account of divine and creaturely agency, according to which divine agency is the ground of creaturely agency, rather than being in competition with it. So that God does not have to withdraw in order to make room for independent creaturely free action, intervening only every so often from a basic position of withdrawal. Arguing... Uh, that this Augustinian or, or non-Pelagian, hang on, yes, sorry, arguing that this Augustinian or non-Pelagian grammar of non-competitive agency is basic to the Christian tradition, Tanner shows how a Pelagian competitive grammar reasserts itself with a special virulence in the modern period. While Tanner's book has been a critical resource for contemporary theologians, exposing faulty mod modern presuppositions and revitalizing basic Christian ones, it has not been received without resistance. One mode of resistance comes in the form of the following charge. To say that God is active everywhere is tantamount to saying that God is active nowhere, because no particular act can be ascribed to God in distinction from any other. My exposition of Miss Scotter is uh, offered as a response of sorts to this charge. Specifically, I'd like to show what concrete difference a non-competitive Christian grammar makes by contrasting it with a pagan grammar, uh, whose collapse of divine into creaturely agency has just the result that the critic of Tanner fears, where everything is divine and so nothing ends up being divine. This will be at the same time to show what the implications of a non-competitive grammar are within a fallen, sinful world. And this is to take a step beyond Tanner's account, which does not reckon explicitly with the spectre of sinful creaturely agency. In other words, a non-competitive agency functions very well when we have to do with a good God who creates good creatures. But what are the implications of appealing to God as non-competitive ground of sinful creaturely agents in particular? My short answer is that it calls those agents from self-deception, the pagan sin as it were, to self-critique. And the rest of my remarks will serve to spell out how this is so. I'll start by offering some examples of a non-competitive grammar within Miss Gotter's biblical ABCs, at the same time drawing attention to the peculiar inflection he gives it. This inflection, I suggest, marks his recognition of the fallenness of creaturely reality, and thus of the necessity of going beyond a simple affirmation of the non-competition between divine and creaturely agents. To anticipate, there is an important sense in which one must talk about God's confrontation of sinful creaturely reality, even while doing so ultimately serves to reinstantiate a non-competitive relation. So situated, it is a non-competition with a difference. The A of the ABCs, according to Miss Scotter, is the name. The name is, quote, an anti-pagan monument distinguishing God from other gods, setting God apart from nature. It cannot, unlike pagan divine names, be generated by projections from experience, but is vouchsafed to us, it is revealed. Thus, on the one hand, it stands over against human activity. But on the other hand, quote, the name is meant for use to name, end quote. Calling upon the name, moreover, encompasses a wealth of human activity, speaking in the name, praying in the name, gathering in it, submitting to it. In other words, one might extrapolate, the name releases us from projective activity and into efficacious activity. Uh, another quote, those who call upon the name do not act in vain. Miss Scotter moves from the particular to the general, 
And more provocatively, he emphasizes God is for us, firstly, smaller, a quality that we understand makes God greater and more glorious than the pagan all. End quote. This God is not the all of nature. This God has a particular name. But once by way of the particular, a critical break has been effected from the world as a suffocating abyssal all, an echo chamber, as we might say in um, terminology familiar today. We are released back into it, but differently, as genuine agents, ones who do not act in vain. A similar dynamic recurs, but with slightly different emphases in Miss Gotter's passing of the acts of God. Interrupting our thinking, these divine acts delimit the space in which we call upon the name. Miss Gotter emphasizes that, quote, not everything that happens can be regarded as an act of God. And he continues, if that were the case, we would be cast back onto the naked existence of things and the divine virtues would be drowned out by grim omnipotence. With this emphasis, he appears to contradict Tanner, siding with those who fear that attributing everything to God means attributing nothing in particular to God. But this isn't the end of the story. While it, might first be, while it must first be established that God, unlike the de demons who act so as to confirm the world in its grimness, um, that God, unlike the demons, acts against the world, it can then be added that in doing so, God acts on its behalf, on behalf of the world. Once we learn in Christ that what God does is intended for us, that focus on the particular, quote, which seems to con contract our field of vision, leads to the reverse, namely the broadening of our perception of the acts of the Lord to world historical and even cosmic dimensions, end quote. In other words, while nature per se cannot be attributed to God, it can be so attributed when it is received in the light of Christ in its intended, intendedness for us. And in this way, we are sent back into our ordinary lives as lives received through encounter with God, the Old Testament history of God's acts becoming our history. A particular God is set over against a fated all. We are released from this all for responsible action. So released, we discover the renewed all in its coextensivity with divine agency. This is the pattern that is emerging. The same can be discovered in Miss Gotter's spelling out of God's way. God has a particular way which, quote, seals its own history within common history, end quote, bringing about what is new. It breaks through the eternal recurrence. But as such, it carves out a path for us, God's way as the way in which we follow as we as we obey God's law, God's way as our way. And just so, quote, sacred history encompasses world history as the latter comes to participate in the newness that God has effected in its midst. The Grundwort sanctification will provide a final and consummate example of the emerging grammar. While the pagan glorifies the all, God disenchants the world by setting apart the exceptional as holy. Above all, God sets God's self apart, distinguishing God's self in and from the world. But God in turn sanctifies both things and people, and more specifically, a people, quote, releasing them from the thrall of the gods. Uh, and another quotation, the sanctification that this God affects is the de-divinization, the disenchantment of the world on our behalf, end quote. The form it takes is covenantal, entailing reciprocity. More specifically, God's, God's act of sanctification elicits not only human sanctification of, for example, the day, the congregation, the tithes, but in and through these acts, human self-sanctification, quote, making their common life a sign of God's will. Miss Gotter sums up, on this account, no domain can be left untouched. God has interfered with humans and their world. And with another and just as necessary emphasis, God has interfered with this human and, this, and their world. If God is a particular God, God is also, and as such, Elohim, the deity. Likewise, sanctification is a particular sanctification, but also and as such, sanctification extends into, well, how better to put it, life, the world, in totality. And a little later, he says more succinctly, this God is our God, and this one is the actor who has made us actors also. A non-competitive logic with a twist, we might say, three moments can be identified. First, God is revealed as a particular God over against the, the totality of the all. 
fate, the void, indifferent existence. Second, this revelation being for us releases human beings for responsive and responsible activity. Third, in and through this activity, the all is reclaimed, but with a difference as the sanctified and redeemed earth. So in very brief, the three movements, contraction, release and expansion. This seems to me to be the basic grammar of, um, of the biblical word. I'll now stand back in order to articulate the basic differences on Miss Gotter's reading, as I take it, between biblical and pagan logics, with respect both to their outworkings and to their presuppositions. Paganism is Miss Gotter's name for an affirmation of the all with no critical distance. This has an odd effect with respect to human agency. On the one hand, such uncritical acceptance makes for a passive bowing to the all as fate. On the other hand, a forgetfulness of revelation as instruction from without means taking everything into one's own hands. In Miss Scotter's words, what we must refute is instruction that flatters us with the idea that we stand on our own two feet, able to save ourselves and so become autonomous, posing our own law upon ourselves. This for Miss Scotter is false autonomy. We see this dangerous conjunction of control and passivity in the twin evils of authoritarianism and populism. Agency takes the form of manipulation on the one hand and of mass instinct on the other as leaders create themselves as self projections of the populace inciting its uncritical emotion. At the root of this dynamic is the rejection of true authority which results from a collapse of divine into human agency, of God into the folk, a collapse which shuts out the space for critical self-reflection. The consequence is that the people are carried away by unsifted fears and desires, no longer able to discern what is their true good. Because of their complicity, this is not just a matter of deception by others, but of self-deception. The people deceive themselves about what is truly good for them. Paganism is, at bottom, self-deception. A biblical grammar, by contrast, holds open the space for critical self-reflection. How? The first mo moment in the threefold grammar is vital. In witnessing to the God who stands as a particular God over against creatures, it sets a limit to human self-aggrandizement, complacency and acquiescence. It interrupts human beings in their schemes, punctures them in their completeness, and pulls them up short in their machinations. This is the moment that is arguably passed over in Catherine Tanner's otherwise commendable analysis. It is the moment that must come to the fore in any explicit confrontation with the fallenness of reality, and especially so, one might argue, when that fallenness takes the form uh, of paganism. Indeed, it is quite difficult, at least in practice, to distinguish Tanner's non-competitive logic, which sets God and creation in non-contrastive relation, um, from a paganism that affirms the identity of God and creation. It may be true that paganism is the other side of the same coin as Pelagianism. Um, that's another hypothesis. Um, but it may also be true that critique of one must take different shape from critique of the other. So in other words, we might need to push beyond Tanner's logic at this point. The first moment um, of uh, Miss Gotter's threefold um, logic that he brings out of the Bible, um, in which a limit is set, issues in keeping with Tanner's logic, however, in the liberation or release of creaturely agency. But in doing so, nevertheless, the space between the divine limit and creaturely agency is held open. That is the space of critical self-reflection. In all human activity, the limit must again and again be discerned as that which brings into question any automatic self-congratulatory action, eliciting, eliciting instead self-reflexive action. Divinely liberated agency is thereby lent a quite different character from the pagan agency that conjoins passivity and control. Instead of passivity, a biblical grammar establishes receptivity. Having been delimited and set apart, human beings are called to discerning response. And by contrast with the, uh, with the control of a false autonomy, human beings are liberated for action that is neither rash nor uncritical, 
but responsible. By contrast with the flattened autonomy of the all, the mass, the populace, this self-reflexive responsible agency is the expression of an autonomy that has been truly engaged. Ms. Scotter asks, how do we find true freedom proceeding from authority? And he continues, authority is here identical to that which is authored. It is not forced upon us, but offered to us. It sheds light and draws us to the light. It occupies us far more than a work of art or a speech. It doesn't win our hearts over through subjugation, but through emancipation. Scripture does not rob us of autonomy, but initiates us into a more intense originality. The truly autonomous self is confronted by an authority that, while being over against it, is ultimately also for it. Thus, by contrast with the uncritically autonomous self that is deceived about its own good, the biblically liberated self is liberated precisely for the critical discernment of its own good. As he emphasizes from the beginning, Miss Scotter's biblical ABCs is about the learning of a language. This language, we can now say in conclusion, provides the grammar of critical self discernment, whether that be individual or communal. More than instruction, it provides the conditions of the possibility of instruction, of the critical pursuit of the truth. This is something we arguably need as much today as in Miss Scotter's own day. Where we have forgotten how to think self-critically, how to reason, we need not to be taught what to think, but to be taught more fundamentally how to think. Thank you. That brings me to the end. Thank you very much indeed, Susanna, for those insights. I think we'll move us ourselves right along uh, to uh, take in Kate Sondrager's comments next. Um, and uh, as we make the change on the screen just to remind you that uh, if and as questions are arising, if you wish to put them in the chat, please do, do so even now and uh, uh, I'll accumulate them as part of our discussion later on. So uh, we'll move to Kate next. Thank you again, Susanna, for your contributions here. A wonderful paper, Susanna, thank you. Um, as you'll see, um, we share some themes in common, I, I think also with the splendid papers before our break. In a marvelous recent essay, Karen Kilby has noted the deafening silence that has greeted Jewish analysis and rebuke of Christianity. Since Nostra Aetate, we Christians have been eager to rethink matters of supersessionism, Christological reading of Holy Scripture, and untold expressions and disguises of idolatry, all under the cloak of proper Christian doctrine. But we have not actually laid to heart the criticism that is most stinging in Jewish insight into Christian thought that it is pagan. Paganism, Rosenzweig famously said, is the birthmark of every Christian, our natural state, so to say. And not just Rosenzweig. This is the cantus firmus of Leo Beck, of Abraham Geiger, of Samson Raphael Hirsch. While Jews are born, Christians are made, baptized out of a pagan matrix against which we constantly struggle, constantly fail. K.H. Miscotti has anticipated, oh, I have to keep waving my arms every once in a while to see if the lights will come back on. No, okay. I hope you can see me anyway. You're clearly visible, Kate. Um, Miscotti has anticipated Kilby's essay by a generation or two and has incorporated the battle against paganism into the very heart of his path-breaking book, Biblical ABCs. This looks at veritas. This is a work of resistance 
Muscati is very firm about this. He does not develop this moral theme directly, but the air of urgency surges through the whole. Muscati considers a proper reading of Holy Scripture better a proper hearing of the Holy Word to be the only source of strength in a world gone mad. The scriptural name for this altogether worldly madness is paganism. That much is crystal clear in Muscati. But I think we might pause here to ask, just what does he think paganism is? Early in the biblical ABCs, Muscati makes a nod to the apostle Paul and his division of the known world into Jew and pagan idolaters. This might suggest that Miscotti entertains the view some historians these days consider itself a product of Christian polemic, that paganism is the belief in polytheism. We can see just such an assumption in the sophisticated handling of this theme in H. Richard Niebuhr's Radical Monotheism and Western Culture. For Niebuhr, the fragmented, competing, often chaotic passions of our intellectual and moral lives are just so many gods reigning over and in our lives as the petty rivalries and sullen inconsistency of the ancient pantheon. Such a view presses paganism in the direction of idolatry, a sin readily recognized in Protestant dogmatics and powerfully adduced in Calvin's Institutes. But in a noteworthy fashion, Miscotti doesn't does not seem drawn to paganism as polytheism or to the problem enunciated so boldly by Tillich at mid-century that faith is simply the claim of the ultimate upon human lives, an existential condition perfectly general and broadly secular in tone. Rather, Muscati seems inclined to define paganism in a striking combination of the innovative and the traditional, most especially the traditional in rabbinic teaching. Themes deeply embedded in scripture and in the Jewish commentarial tradition have been absorbed by Muscati and reworked for service in the dark hour of his day. Early in the biblical ABCs, Miscotti evokes the long-standing Jewish definition of paganism as the worship of nature or chthonic powers. Paganism in this view is a kind of numinosity granted to the things of this world an adoration of the creature rather than the creator, as the Apostle Paul would have it. To these notions of paganism as forms of captivating nature worship, Muscati adds the classical patristic denunciations of paganism, the worship of wealth, the crass and flattened view of worldly events as fate, the terrible power to which even the gods must bow down and obey, and the desire or fear to find divine spirits enclosed within the living things of this earth, their hidden, relentless force. But Miscotti has more than ancient sources in mind here. More powerfully, he evokes the rabbinic denunciation of paganism as the romantic rebellion against the transcendence and aseity of God. 
Paganism, most especially in post-Enlightenment thinkers, took the form of a melting oblivion into the glories and sublimity of the natural. The romantic cultus of nature, shorn of the human defilement of city and dwelling, has no human scale history to grasp or to honor or confront. It is in Leo Beck's arresting phrase, an eternal now that ends history and more ends commandment, moral striving. All is already given in the embodied, the sensual, the fertile, and the oceanic. And human life finds its fulfillment in becoming one with these subterranean drives. It may well be that Rudolf Otto's famous work on the numinous, issued in the 1920s, would have struck Miscotti's ears as an appeal to paganism, now under the guise of a complex Kantianism. It's easy to imagine what Miscotti hears in these traditional denunciations of the pagan. He catches the rustle of romantic and focused lo longings that were to come to ruthless consummation in the Nazi party. It's family and blood and soil, yes. And it's smug bourgeoisement. But there's a greater menace than these. It's the shadowed worship of power expressed as cruelty, of violence, of destruction, of glittering terror that exhilarates and excellence, as Nietzsche was to express it, that vaulted beyond good and evil. Against all this, Miscotti counsels a steady, relentless, and faithful resistance. I suppose we have seen enough of the enchantment of the tyrant and the strong man in our own day the explosive rivers of nationalism and violence that run deep underground, to say that Muscati's lesson has not been learned, never been learned by heart, by Christians or other worldlings that share our lot. Just this modern Jews will say is the unceasing struggle we Christians must wage against the satyr and the Moloch that live within. The weapon in our struggle is Torah, the divine teaching. Here, Miscati enters deep into a scriptural world in which Israel's scriptures are magistra. And this, I think, is a very great strength of this primer. Muscati describes the proper Christian place for a reverent hearing of Torah as a bet midrash, a house of study, a synagogue set up next to the temple. He readily makes use of the long-standing rabbinic claim that Torah is not properly captured by the modern and Christian term law but is rather to be tied intimately to debar, the living word that instructs. In the Christian Bet Midrash, we hear an urgent summons to leave behind the pagan, the worldly, the secure, for a worship of a God who is this very one, the concrete Lord God, who is so particular that he can be spoken of as a God. The struggles of the young bard against the force he called natural theology 
rings out in these early passages of the biblical ABCs. We cannot speak of the Lord God in abstractions as supreme bearer of bloodless attributes such as omnipotence, omniscience, impassibility. Or perhaps better, as Miscotti says, we cannot begin there. The pressure to universalize and rationalize the one God is Christian paganism. However refined and transcendent it all appears at the outset, for it is a conviction that God is the unknown. Abstract traits are not necessary, Miscotti says. They are not even rational. This is because the metaphysical perfections of God follow the natural contours of the human intellect as it strives to think transcendent. It is a form of naturalism, I think we would now say, in the structure of the doctrine of God. Miscotti in this work is careful not to be diverted from his basic task by extended reflections upon theological method or power of reference in human conceptuality. In this way, Miscotti strikes me as a nearer cousin to the biblical realists of Barth's formative years, to the Blumharts, say, or to Hermann Kutter, than to the sustained conceptual struggles evidenced by Bard in his own dialectical method and his decades-long striving to place analogical predication on biblical foundations. Instead, Miscotti dares to take the very notion of paganism into territories perilously close to the pagan realm itself as expressed in antiquity. He insists, for example, that God must be wholly concrete. The Almighty One must be known as the name. Clearly a nod to the great rabbinic commentary and honorific on Hashem, Miscotti holds that a living faith in God must be directed to the one known by name in Holy Scripture. The biblical ABCs lean heavily upon the notion of revelation. It performs the measured methodological work that is to be done in this treatise, interlacing the ineffability of the name with the unsurpassed concreteness of God in biblical Torah. The Lord discloses his name to Moses, and Miscotti takes this revelation to stipulate that God is wholly self-possessed and zealously guards his own priority and magic. I will be who I will be, best captures the dialectical act of giving a name that withholds the creaturely control afforded by a name. All this may sound familiar fair to one raised on Bart's early sermons and essays published in English as Word of God and Word of Man. But Miscotti is actually far more concrete, more scandalously individualized than anything Bart would countenance. Miscotti says that we must recognize that we worship a God. He is that daring. He runs through a list of names given to the singular God, El Shaddai, Elohim, Adonai Sabaoth. These have particular traits that we are per permitted to assign to the concrete Lord so that we may refer to him rightly without pretending we can harmonize or rationalize these attributes. 
They are unified only by the event of God's love. Just so we might say that these are elements of concreteness, the groundwork within the one God that lay claim to us and prepare us for the resistance we must one day offer. Yet we have to acknowledge in the midst of so much that is stirring and morally powerful in Muscati's treatment of Torah here, that in his unstinting emphasis upon individuality and particularity in God, brings his doctrine of God daringly close to a form of paganism the early Christians and rabbis would abhor. The notion that God is a God with borders, so to say, and particular traits that pick him out, even from others, we might say, sounds perilously close to the local deities our ancestors knew well from every spring and leafy grove and menacing cave. Of course, many modernist Christians and Jews found such localized particularity in the ancient portions of Israel's scriptures. This was the henotheism that was providentially elevated and purified by the prophets, most especially in the prophet Isaiah. But even this term of art from the religions Geschichte school betrayed a conviction that paganism came in the form of individual gods with names and traits to single them out. Miscotti is bold indeed in his sunny conviction that paganism is actually a refusal to move first from the particular to the universal and only from the singular to the metaphysical conceptions of transcendence and thus to refuse to bend the, our neck to the easy yoke, the ABCs of the concrete God. And he does more. Early in the biblical ABCs, Miscotti makes the remarkable claim that paganism is the refusal to see the singular God become human. Now, I think this is where we might ask most intently just what Miscotti understands paganism to be. As is well known, Jews consider the plastic appearance of the gods on earth, their Vorstellung or representation to be the epitome of paganism. These are the stories of the gods, the very thought world of mythology and paganism in their antique guise. Miscotti does not simply resist this definition, he rather turns it on its head. Christians have in the past, when they have bothered to lay to heart at all the rabbinic or Islamic criticism of divine human mingling have been inclined to treat the incarnation as the exception or as the exaltation and purification of ancient paganism. Miscotti is not so reserved. Rather, he insists that the incarnation is the very defeat of paganism. And only those who resist this Torah deserve the name pagan. It is a bold thinker who will define Jews and Muslims as pagans. But this seems to me the near ineluctable implicator of Muscati's claim. 
Now, I think there's a deep theological and moral reason Miscotti turns his argument into these wind-tossed waters. And this brings us back to our original mise-en-scene, the resistance that the Christian is to give when properly instructed in the Bet Midrash. We are to begin and end with Israel, Mascate tells us, so that we can readily affirm that a rejection of Judaism is far from his mind. But I think he considers the particular menace of Nazi paganism to be expressed fundamentally and most violently as anti-humanism, a rejection of the human. The Nazi Reich not only refused to listen, always it imagined itself the instructor and master. But more, it considered everything human and humane, everything tender or vulnerable or rare as defiled and dispensable. The cruelty of Nazi law made the Egenitosarchs of the Joanine prologue a resistance to all that, a courageous devotion to the flesh, which the eternal son saw fit to assume, and in loving sacrifice to die to save. It is to that resistance that Muscati calls us still, a war against the pagan who will not honor the flesh Christ came to save. We may not wish to treat paganism in quite this daring and I would say idiosyncratic fashion, but I for one pray that to Muscati's call to a true humanism, we may incline our ears yet and commit our lives. Our world needs such disciples. Thank you for the honor of presenting a brief paper in Muscati's honor. Thank you very much indeed for that and for uh, um managing your lighting situation so well. Um, you can be seeing lights on or off. Um, <laughs> that's, that's good to know. It radiance just... travels with you. So um, thank you very much indeed. We'll, uh, as ever, uh, continue to accumulate questions in the chat if uh, folks have them from things that, that have already been said. And as we do that, we'll invite our third panelist, Christophe Charlemagne, now uh, to uh, offer his remarks before some more general conversation between us. Christoph. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to, to be with us, with you today, I mean. Ms. Scott's book is a confirmation that in times of deep crisis, people look for the most basic elements which can sustain human existence, and in this case, Christian existence. Back to the basics is perhaps the program of this book. The aim is to explore anew the most significant aspects of the Christian faith, drawing from the scriptures, including significantly a sustained scrutiny of the Old Testament. The result is a sort of biblical theology or a biblically grounded theology that I personally find quite compelling. I think we need similar theological works today. This sentence in the book resonates with me it is still quite timely, also in relation to academic theology as we practice it. Quote, the word comes to us with a simplicity that puts our complications to shame, end of quote. One of the striking features of the book is that despite the extremely challenging context of the time, 1941, this context does not appear with great clarity. The context is not named with precision, as far as I can tell. And of course, that's debatable. Why? Of course, there's the censorship. 
but also perhaps because everybody knew it firsthand, the context, and did not need to be informed about the terrible events of the day. But still, even if everyone knew about these events, wasn't there a need to interpret them a bit more precisely? Does the book offer such an interpretation? Barely, as I see it. The most obvious allusions to the context of the war are found, in my opinion, in the recurring mentions of paganism and natural religion. We've discussed that already all afternoon. When Miscote writes about, quote, the elemental violence of spiritual battle, end of quote, we get a glimpse of the context, even if in a rather fuzzy way, at least for us 80 years later. I must admit I was a bit puzzled by the few indications of the historical context. Certainly since May 1940 and the inv invasion of the Netherlands by Nazi Germany, it was potentially a very risky thing to comment on it with a certain degree of precision. And so perhaps I should not be too surprised. My other reaction reading the book concerns the amount of insights that actually come from Karl Barth, including volume 2-1 of the Kirchliche Dogmatik, notably on God's love and even more, I think, on God's power. I, don't, I do not wish to delve on this, but simply put, Miss Cotter's depth appears to me to be enormous. If I had to summarize it, perhaps I would use the Latin phrase ad augusta per angusta to the heights through narrow roads. Miss Cote has learned from Bart that thinking theologically requires to think first about the particulars of the faith, rather than begin with generalities. This has been emphasized all afternoon long also. It is only through the narrow road, angusta, of God's revelation in Jesus Christ, that one begins to understand who God is, who human beings are, what the world is like, and so forth ad augusta per angusta. And here is how Miss Cote puts it, and I'm quoting here a passage that has been already quoted uh, earlier by Susanna. God is not the all, but is known as a reality that distinguishes itself in the world from the world. God does not appear to us as the most general, that which can be found everywhere, but rather as the most unique, that which can be sought and found somewhere specific. This does not mean God couldn't be the most general and the all-powerful and the omnipresent, but rather that the road to knowledge does not begin with the general. It's on page 19. The problem is that with this approach, dialogue with other fields of knowledge appears to be more difficult at first sight at least, or perhaps at a superficial first sight. Christian theology tends to fare better in state universities, at least, when it begins with the general rather than with its most specific, uh, what is most specific to it. Some are so convinced of this that they end up choosing the path of religious studies over Christian theology as the work of responsibly thinking about the faith. Of course, I'm not one of those, but... Uh, I must say I found the final chapter, chapter 12, titled The Life of Community, to be among the most interesting chapters in the book. Probably because I am particularly concerned about the present and the future shapes of Christianity and Christian communities in Western Europe. In France and Switzerland, a number of clear-sighted church leaders are calling for a major shift from the old outdated model of the Volkskirche, the church of the multitude, of course that has disappeared to the multitude, uh, that offers spiritual support without calling on people to particular Christian commitments. A shift from this kind of church, the Volkskirche, to a different ecclesiology centered on the notion of witness and witnesses. I think Ms. Cote was already making a similar argument in his book. He writes, I quote, we desire that communities transform from spectators into participants, page 145. And see also the question that he raises elsewhere in the book on page 140, is the lasting apostolic zeal of an individual 
conceivable without a community or at least a, a core group that is living under the word. End of quote. I find this idea of a core group intriguing and worth considering, not as an ecclesiola in ecclesia, the anti-pietist accents in Miss Cotter's book are unmistakable and they're good, I think, but as groups of disciples who remind other disciples of the radicality of Christian existence in community. Ms. Cote articulates two claims that have not lost any of their relevance 80 years later in a completely different context or very different context. We need first, quote, to proclaim the gospel with strong, broad strokes to the fallen and feral peoples. I was puzzled by this word feral and pursue mission along several fronts, including a mission that proclaims the truthfulness of God's wrath. I, I would not put it exactly in those terms, but I found it interesting. And the second aspect, we need to form, protect, and strengthen core groups of people in the community who are called to the lay apostolate. End of quote. It's on page 138. The second point seems important to me and is directly linked to the first one, of course, the first one uh, on proclaiming the gospel, etc. Ms. Cote's lament rings true, in my context at least. And I quote again, we have a church and we have individual believers, but we do not have communities. That is truly a tragic and far-reaching misfortune. We search in vain for little more than very minor traces of living together, of a spiritual community that knows itself and as such stands and acts in the world. Page 135. I come to the end of my little presentation. Scripture was supposed to nourish the lives of Christians in a much more central and decisive way in the wake of the Second Vatican Council. But has Roman Catholicism achieved this aim? Protestants are supposed to be people of the book, but their relation to the Bible has become very loose, and many of them are ill-equipped for the meditation and study of the Bible. Historical and critical exegesis has helped us avoid absurd or silly, uninformed readings of the Bible. But in many instances, it has not fostered a theological reading of the Bible. Orthodox Christians seem to often have more fondness for the fathers than for the scriptures. And so here, I think Ms. Cote's book serves as a wake-up call for all Christians, also beyond the major families that I have just alluded to, uh, to, to get back to the communal study of the scriptures. Exegetically, exegetically, also theologically. And so this notion of Beit Midrash is very compelling and very interesting and could lead to some uh, interesting uh, creative uh, proposals still today. So these were the, the few comments I wanted to, to bring up. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Christoph for that. Um, we're, uh, we're grateful to all of our presenters for their contributions, for the readings they brought to the text, um, the particular things which gr uh, grabbed attention, raised questions, um, uh, and have drawn out the comments and the insights which you've shared with us. So we're very grateful to you for all of that. Um, we have a little bit of time now. Uh, we're, we're scheduled to uh, run this session till about quarter after the hour, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we'll take the time that we have to uh, uh, to speak amongst ourselves and then also, of course, to field questions as they come in. And please do I'll continue to encourage folks to make use of, of the of the chat to raise questions. Um, one thing I wondered if I might ask uh, all th three of you to reflect on a bit. It was interesting for me hearing your, your comments kind of in real time to think about the things that might um, kind of gel between them um, as as distinct as they were. One of the observations which um, I will, I'll share and then uh, invite comment if you're willing, is that all three of you are, I think, 
uh, captivated by the dynamism and the teleology of the work. Um, there's something kind of profoundly programmatic about it, the, the, the book, and uh, your comments in different ways pick out that programmatic element as a uh, both for reflection and then also um, uh, uh, in general terms um, for uh, commendation, right? Um, it, you know, here's a system which, uh, though it sort of majors on a theme, majors on that theme precisely for the sake of putting something in motion, which, uh, you know, is a corrective to a certain kind of paganism or uh, uh, a, a certain mode of human re religiosity in the world, but it's exactly for the sake of that movement that the pieces are are what they are, you know, and Christoph's comments to the, the thought that the book, it, it terminates in chapter 12 um, in a series of programmatic proposals for reshaping Christian life. Um, again, the, the the sort of ordering of that, the, the order for the sake of life, and, um, Susanna, you picked it out as well. Um, uh, that the the recover the thing that you recover on the other side of the threefold movement, or as a consequence of the threefold movement you described, is is the ability to live in the world <laughs> as a human being, um, uh, 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 courtesy of uh, entirely uh, uh, courtesy of um, uh, the divine gift of that possibility um, that was no possibility. A, apart from the movement um and likewise uh, thinking about your comments kate the 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 way in which the incarnation you know kind of emerges as this fascinating and troubling uh, mm -hmm. uh point of of reference it seemed to me as though um uh in in the book there's a kind of conflation or a delision between the philanthropy of of the god of israel and incarnation and as you say the the, the sort of the desire to see the programmatic uh, account of Christian life drive towards an embrace and an echoing in human life of that philanthropy, uh, and to try to find the kind of theological resources to 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 uh, make that happen. Um, there's so much going on, but it all seems so strongly um, theological and and actually, of course, quite practical. Uh, for all that the book is, you know, self in its own self description, highly formal and methodological, and so on. Um, uh, uh, it really is, is as you've all th three pointed out, a book with teeth, if that's the way to say it, or it's a book that has designs on you as a reader. Um, it wants to take you somewhere, and it also wants to describe uh, more profoundly than that, even um, uh, the the fact that. Uh, the Lord God of Israel interferes uh, towards a certain kind of definite end, right? Um, uh, and that that interference is on its way to something. So, um, not not exactly a question, but a, but I guess an observation about features of the text, which which at least in form seem to have caught all of your eyes. And I wondered if if just having had some space to to think now, if there were things that you might want to 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 pick up from each other's. Uh, comments or if that theme um, at all, the, the way in which order uh, and telos uh, and the kind of drive to um, uh, to to generate uh, uh, definite forms of life in the world, uh, whether there are aspects of that uh, any of you would like to say something more about. And then we'll take questions from the chat after that. Um, please just kick in, um, uh, speak as you will. You know, this whole theme of resistance, I think, is I took it to be the central underlying premise of the book and gave it um, gave the book the the urgency and the dynamism that it has. Um, so I I take resistance to be the thing the better resistance uh, that we're, we're taught by the, the living word and that it has to do with this, this particular God confronting us in our lives and liberating us from this occupation so that, that we could actually respond and live as lights in the world. Um, and how that 
how that relates to to his his particular handling of paganism that's that's one of the continuing questions i have in my mind and and perhaps um if i studied the the silence of the gods i i think um I, I, this would be um, uh, spelled out more fully for me. Mm. Might I chip in? Please, of course, yes. Oh, yep. Thanks. Um, I certainly heard um, some real resonance with um, Christoph's emphasis on moving from spectator to uh, participant and on communities at the end. Um, between that and my emphasis on agency is as what's being liberated um, for action in the world, um, on the one hand. Um, uh, but another emphasis I, I might want to draw out, I, I suppose possibly in questioning Kate's reading, and this is where I felt very provoked by you, Kate, on, on his inversion of paganism, as it were. Yeah. Um, I, I read his text more performatively, that he's moving us from um, the, um, the specific God, the, the A God, as it were, to, uh, and through that anthropomorphism, um, to something which ends up reconnecting um, with what one might have learned through various anti-idolatrous practices and might learn in common with Jews and Muslims. Um, and insofar as I saw it caught up in that kind of performative dynamism, I didn't see it in, in, in quite that really sort of thoroughly provocative way that you read it. So I'm, I'm interested to hear more there and, and whether you thought that he stopped with the particular God um, in, in that way, or, yeah. So that's really an another effect. Yeah, I mean, uh, certainly that movement from the particular to the general, I, I agree with you, Christoph, that 2-1 that, uh, is, is everywhere, and in, in my ears anyway, um, in, in the book. Um, yeah, I, I thought they claim um, that the incarnation is the antithesis to paganism is um, twinned with that opening framework uh, of the, um, the indirect citation of, of Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians uh, of, um, between Jew and Gentile. Um, uh, and that... Uh, this this particular God incarnate in Christ is the is the overthrow of this distinction and in this way I I think hmm, he he comes close to speaking about God as 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 local and as um, as enfleshed, and that this is the sole um, overcoming of paganism. And um, I mean, after all, uh, Christians are going to have profound um, encounters and and uh, differences with Jews and Muslims. Um, but to do it on the basis of paganism seems to me very bold. I mean, he he takes a, this is what I wanted to ask Susanna, and I I will I will let Christoph get a word in here, but I that reference to the all I, I mean surely he gets that from from the star and from Cone and I, um and, and writing against the the all and the way he does um. Uh, strikes me as um, is a quite remarkable reading of Rosen's. Insofar though as it's a reading of Rosenzweig, I took him to be working with him there in that kind of dialectical mode um, mm -hmm. and precisely critiquing the kind of paganism that Rosenzweig also critiques. But you've done this inversion, which I, I, I yeah, it's really thrown me actually. So I, I don't quite know what to do with it, but yeah. The complexity, I mean, the complexity lurks somewhere, doesn't it? In the, in the sort of multivalent 
function of the word paganism. You know, in one hand, it, yeah, it operates yeah. as a sort of historical referent in the context of of of, uh, of remarks that, that are made specifically about ancient Israel and its environment. In another way, it's a kind of term of art for a sort of anthropological reality, right? Some kind of um, some kind of it's a cipher for what Homo religiosus or something, right? Um, as a yeah. uh, as a condition, a human condition, and then on the other hand, as you say, Kate, it also it seemed to pick out something, and as Christoph was 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 uh, calling for too, and hoping for more of right. something quite the special context. in the sort of local, intellectual, and historical cultural context in which the book is written. You know, something like the kind of romantic religion that Beck, you know, was on about. Uh, critically or even more proximately and more pressingly this the sort of ideological forms of captivity that and their their particular kind of romance this and you know the, the language of the all there being less perhaps Rodens, from Rosenzweig and more from what um, a certain kind of um, mm -hmm. Wagnerian right. rhapsodic mm -hmm. function yeah or shelling or something that, yeah that's right mm -hmm. so it, it's a term that does a thousand things um, and I guess trying to trying to to sort of, at, we're all asking about whether those things can all be done by the same term term uh, uh, in sequence, or whether or not there wouldn't be useful and helpful distinctions to be made to be made here. Um, uh, Christoph, did you want to come in? With no, 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 no. Thank you. One further question that that struck me is, and you all sort of picked it out because it is, of course, as we are, we heard all. Also earlier in the day, one of the the sort of relentless themes of the book is is the sort of the particular, the, the emphasis on the particular, um, uh, and specifically the the particularity of God. Um, and I wondered if if I could draw any of you to say a little bit more about that. I I I kind of came away from my encounter with a puzzle as to whether or not particularity is a is a notion that he wants to sort of stand in for transcendence. <laughs> Right, that's something uh, it acquires its proper freedom precisely in virtue of the radicality of its particularity. Right, it's so what it is that it transcends genre. Right, it's not captured by anything. It's um, uh, it's a curious, or it's it's an unusual uh, function uh mm -hmm. to ascribe to particularity but i wondered if that was was kind of the dynamic of what he was after because the typical st strategies for transcendence would seem to fall foul of his worry about abstraction right you know you get you push something away by making it ever more general and impersonal and so on so on so on so this is the, this the sort of uh uh, kind of jujitsu like opposite move, right? You know, you the closer you can bring something, the 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 more particular you can make it, the the more radically you honor its transcendence. I wondered if 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 uh, well, j just if you had had f further comments about the particularity and the the role of particularism in 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 his thinking here, and then we'll take Miriam Elber's question, who has her hand up next. So you think it, he's reading it like Kierkegaard there? Yeah, that's. I think that might be that's uh, much more mm, uh, the way to say. Well, it. that's. Uh, I mean, that's a really interesting um, observation and fits in with with Susanna's points very well. I, um, I mean, of course, I, I. I just. I. I can't be persuaded that actually this this claim that being a god is is the way to handle transcendence and the divine attributes but yeah. uh, if you think that singularity could be the way to express god not being in a genus yeah maybe you could you could get something like um like hexatos out of this and i and maybe this is what miss Scotty is thinking about christoph do you want to go next or should i not yet okay uh, i mean this seems to me to connect to the previous theme as well um and it, depending on how one takes particularity will affect how one then understands the paganism that he's critiquing <sighs> Um, and I've taken it, I think, in a, in, more in the direction that Phil is gesturing there. Um, first of all, by weaving it into a kind of Tanner-esque uh, non-competitive um, 
That was oh, lovely. Yeah. That was a great yeah. move. Yeah. Thank you. Um, however, it is doing it's doing a job that she can't do, in, as I understand it, insofar as it sets this limit, which calls then human beings to self critique. So there's there's something about um, God being over against, um, which is lost in a move to transcendence, which doesn't go via some kind of particularity. Um, but even then, I'm still I, I worry that I'm plugging it too much into a kind of apophatic. Um, grammar that's very natural to me but might not be natural to Miss Scottish so I, please resist if this is not right um, but in other words this, this yeah I've read it as a, you have to grasp anthropomorphism because it's the only thing that we, we we can only speak in that way as it were and whether you talk about God being um, ineffable or uh, a thing um, both will have to um, in some way move us dynamically beyond whatever we think we've got as it were um, and so I suppose I, I saw that being the role of, of his, his his going through the particular um, yeah but I I may be really in error on that so and I'd love to hear more from others mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe I'll invite at this point Miriam to come in in case, uh, or, and if your question takes us elsewhere, that's fine too, Miriam. But you may also have uh, wish to comment on on these themes. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I, I was uh, responding to the, the the previous discussion about um, uh, paganism, um, and I, I I think that paganism is a truly uh, theological category. Uh, with Miss Cotta and not at all a historical category in 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 every way and and, and it shows because um, for Miss Cotta monotheism is is really not an issue. It's not it's not in the front line of his thinking. It is not it's not relevant to him. And it and he says it in in biblical ABCs. He says monotheism is not not very special. So it's not special. Um, and so for him paganism. And maybe even the worst scenarios of paganism are monotheistic. So, so yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah, uh, uh, th th that's that's the idea. So, so paganism should should really be be uh, taken apart from from the historical or the polytheistic uh, notions that we usually have with it. Uh, and 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 therefore, yeah, maybe unlike uh, uh, you, Kate, um, he feels that monotheism is not what Israel has brought to the world. It is this specialty, this, this, this special God. And, and that's, I think, the, uh, the difference. But that, that was just uh, what I wanted to say. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, Christoph, please. Just very briefly, I think the one word that is missing perhaps in our conversation is the notion of person, the person, personality of God. And the emphasis that Ms. Cote places on this notion is very important to understand what he means by a God. I think you have to have this notion of divine personality very much in, in, in your mind. Yeah, that's good. What I, what I miss is that, that way uh, Bart handles personality and the absolute in, in two, one. That's, I, Everything in in the biblical ABCs seems so much. It's so intensely focused on uh, uh, on God being smaller, uh, um, being being particular, being concrete. Um, I don't know how you actually get out of the the particular to the general. I, I see him making that move, um, but I don't see how he has um, uh, how he um, lays rights to that move. I, uh, um, the the particulars it's so strongly emphasized, and that it it's that very thing that um that rabbinic commentators are are worried about in the uh, in the anthropomorphisms in scripture um that it it, it makes god uh, singular in such a way that um that 
um, God could be set against the gods, you know, Psalm 82. And this, this is what, what the prophets um, uh, lead us to understand more, more deeply, more profoundly. Yeah, this is this is something I I worry about in this book. Could it help to say a little bit more about what the monotheism is that he's wanting not well not to engage with? And I'm wondering, yeah, Christoph, if you had that in mind when you were talking about personality and how emphasizing God as person might move you away from a, a more anonymous kind of um, monotheism. Or maybe not. Anonymous? In what way anonymous? Uh, well, I suppose abstract might be another term. So a, a monothe, which end up in those sort of rather flat, bland theisms, um, where we don't have a God who is called upon um, and is to be addressed and addresses. Yeah. I don't know. I, you know, I see him move from the, the God, the... the the saving God, or I don't know how he puts it exactly, the God who, who hears the cry of his people, etc., mm -hmm. to the creator God. I think that's the, that's the, the path that he uh, cho chooses, and that uh, is very Martin, of course. And that's the, the bridge to, to the God of the universe, which is not really spelled out. I agree with you, Kate, that there's something that is way too thin, perhaps, there that he doesn't really go on that path, perhaps, of articulating the God who hears the cry of God's people to the creator God. But I think there, is some, there are some lineaments of this in the book, nevertheless. Yeah, you can see where he'd, he'd want to, to head in a, in a broader text, um, and maybe in the silence of the gods that, that I have not read. Uh, he he works this out, um, but here I I could feel the the urgency of the claim of this particular God uh, upon me, um, as uh, disclosed in Scripture and in Israel's teachings. And in the the um, command to um, to live fully and and recklessly in the world, um, yeah. But it's it um, it does not make use of any of the um, the medieval or rabbinic forms of of exegesis that no. that allow um, God's um, metaphysical attributes to be unfolded in scripture mm -hmm. um, I wonder so if, it, if so uh, it seems to me a, a book that honors um, uh, Judaism in, in a, a particular way, um, but not, but perhaps I should say it honors Israel, um, but not the rabbinic tradition that uh, develops in, in post-biblical period. Could it be that this has, oh, sorry, Christoph, you come in first if you want. No, um, okay, <laughs> I'll carry on. Um, that, it, it, that has to do with a particular task he has to hand, which is to retrieve this language. Um, and he's not actually speaking it yet, as it were. So all he's doing is pointing to the alphabet in which one might speak it. And could there be yeah, something true. Uh, insofar as, yeah, this, this emphasis on the particular might go together with an emphasis on the particular letters in the alphabet as it were and until you actually start speaking it um we're not going to get back to the creator god or or, or find those roots which you're finding missing um in this text 
or even do uh, what the, the rabbis do, which is, which I, I think one would describe that as already speaking the language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there are a couple of sort of um, pathways that might be sort of signposted that 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 one could, one could should must might travel down uh, to get at these issues in the book, but but which he himself, as Suzanne just said, doesn't travel. So I've just two things come to mind as you've been speaking. One is the, and Christoph picked it out, the the kind of ordering of um, of um, redemp of creation to redemption, right? You know, redemption is first soteriology, creation is reflex. Um, you there are obviously ways and means of tracing that line, right? And doing things with that that take you from from the, this God of the Exodus, the deliverer, to um, to uh, the God who who right. who, who is the source of the yeah. all. Yeah. So that's kind of one. The other would be you you'll remember from the text. There's he's fond of the of the um, the verse. Uh, what is it? Psalm one hundred three. Just the opening line, right? You, you know, know that the Lord is God, right? And that sequence is the right. one that he wants to pick out. So presumably, I mean, having said that, you haven't said much about what that is means, right? And how to work it out and what kinds of what kinds of elaborations are licit in this context and which kinds of elaborations of that is are illicit and why they are. And so like, you know, every question sort of remains to be answered except for the, the, the direction of movement, which he wants to recommend, which is always from the name to the predicate. So God, God is a predicate of the name, but you know, once you've made that move, is there a reflex? Can you come back on the name, you know, in the way that uh, you know a, a good deal of this uh, of the rabbinic commentary to which you're pointing, Kate, you know, does right? Uh, once we've had this thought, then the the thoughts with which we begun are no longer thoughts with which we can stay, right? There's a kind of there's a kind of developmental dynamic in that kind of thinking, which which doesn't it's it's not um, it's not a prominent piece of the work, isn't it? And there's, a, he's, he's, he's also not, not uh, particularly interested in investing in developmental accounts of, of Jewish thought, even on the pages of the Old Testament, is he? He doesn't have a stake in playing the prophets off over against the earlier forms or, 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 or whatnot. There's a sort of kind of level to the text in a way, which is interesting too. So that would be another, I suppose, strategy, you know, which might be be to say at some point these particular forms emerge as crucial, but that's not the last moment in a process, right? Uh, and whether that's a biblical or, or an extra biblical process, I, I, you know, would be part of the, the the tale that needs telling. Yeah, Christoph, please. Just very briefly, I think we also need to remember the genre of the book, the literary genre. It's not a systematic theology. It's not a dogmatic treatise. He makes that very clear here and there throughout the book. It's an ABC, which I think, by the way, I would have titled ABC in the singular in English. But uh, so I, I, I wonder about the adding of the S. I saw the comments, of course, of the translators, etc. But I would, I would have opted, I think, for the singular. Um, so, you know, the literary genre, he's, he's picking up on key notions and he's not articulating them dogmatically, systematically. I think we need to, to bear that in mind as well. Yeah. Good. Well, having confessed our, our uh, confrontation with the enigmatic, the, the, uh, the partial and the, the, um, uh, the programmatic, um, we should probably bring our conversation to a, to a close if that's all, all right with folks. We've, uh, we started a little later, so we've, we've I think, not, not run hugely, hugely over time. Um, there, there will be people, people who haven't yet been able to ask questions. I know where Rince's hand I see is up now too. Um, please do read to uh, be, be, be in touch with folks. You can make use of the chat. Um, you can, uh, of course, speak to people directly as well. Um, can I just thank uh, all three of our panelists, Kate and Suzanne and Christoph, for their uh, their contributions, for the care with which they've approached the text and for the, the energy you brought to the conversation here this afternoon. We're all in your debt for that. Um, mm -hmm.